But first, I want to ask you um, about the recent announcement of Russian President Vladimir Putin, that happening, um, I think, just 30 minutes ago, announcing an operation on Ukraine, telling local forces to stand down, telling international forces to back off. Has the Russia-Ukraine conflict reached a point now of no return? Professor. Well, I hope not. You know, that's the problem, Carmina, with euphemisms like peacekeeping force, a special military operation. You know, I'm sure you know where I come from. We really need an operational definition. I mean, what do those words mean? Because we know they have been there in eastern uh, Ukraine. They have been there in the Donbas region for since the Maidan revolution of 2014. So what are we talking about? Hmm. So now I was just listening to uh, CGTN, the Chinese channel, and the reporters are saying that they are hearing north, west, south, you know, everywhere. Uh, you know, they, they're they hearing uh, well, what look like uh, some explosions and they don't know what it looks like. In the meanwhile, uh, they were informed that uh, Putin had ordered that the airspace between the Ukraine and the Russia will be off limits. So, mm. you know, the fog of war, when you're dealing with a flood of information, it's very difficult to tease them out and just to make any conclusion. But, you know, at bottom, we hope uh, the, the West and uh, Putin will continue to talk, even while the United Nations is dealing with us uh, with um, this major concern. And, um, you know, my, 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 my really concern, uh, Carmina, is mm. how long can they push Putin until he takes the nuclear option? Mm. Have you have you thought of that? I mean, because this is, oh my God, this is yeah. the one superpower who had all the nuclear warheads behind him. And the, the the West just keeps on pushing and pushing him. And I like what the University of Chicago political scientists said, that it was really the West which created the Ukraine crisis. And I'm, you know, digging up on its political history, and I tend to be on the same page with them. I want to go back to what you said about euphemisms being used. The same euphemisms were used during the annexation of Crimea in 2014, Professor Carlos. So you do get a sense of this already happening before, but how will this, how is this time different from what happened in 2014? I think it's um, it's similar and it's a different. It's different because you have ratcheted up the, the temperature on all levels, on all dimensions. But to what extent we will take the next step, which is really an all out um, uh, confrontation, I doubt, I still doubt we will go there because, you know, I'm sure you've heard Biden saying many, many, many times that Ukraine is not a core national interest of the United States. If you will notice, they put some a few warm bodies in Poland, how far away is Poland from Ukraine? Mm. You understand? They're just going through the motions. There's too much verbal calisthenics. In fact, if you will notice when he had the summit with, uh, what's his name, Vladimir Putin, they didn't even invite the EU nor the NATO uh -huh. because both Macron and uh, Draghi of Italy both declared that the NATO is dead. In fact, Ukraine is uh, giving life to the NATO. So uh, how much of what we see right now is just mere posturing? But, and how much of it is real? Um, real by, by, by real, I mean having a tendency to evolve into something else, like a full-blown war. Yeah, I think it goes beyond posturing. It's almost like it's a strategy of brinkmanship, you know? It's like a poker game and how, how much are you going to, to give in and at what point will be a tipping point when we're just who blinks first? I mm. hope it does not come to that. And as I continue to say, if you're my friend in the Facebook, listen to Macron, because Macron really knows what is going on. Macron is so deeply soaked in the in the history of Ukraine and Russia, their hearts beating as one, you know, common yeah. language, common religion. Let's pay attention to those things, which many journalists don't pay attention to, but history is important. In you fact, know, there are want, many, yeah. many, um, Russian, uh, uh, native Russians speaking um, Ukrainians are still there in Ukraine because, of, as you said, they were one uh, before when you go um, down that path and looking um, at the deep history, the very deep history that these um, two countries share. But will this, this is a question in most people's minds, um, Professor Carlos, will what we're seeing now between Russia and Ukraine, 
evolve into some sort of a proxy war between the U.S. and China. Is that something that you're also looking into? Well, uh, China is, uh, is in a quandary now, Carmina. Remember two weeks ago at the start of the Olympics, Putin was there in Beijing and they reiterated their strategic partnership. Not only that, Xi Jinping also declared that, okay, Putin, I'm with you in regard to Xinjiang, uh, mm -hmm. or rather too, in regard to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, but remember, China too has economic interests in Ukraine because it buys military equipment there. It has huge infra contracts there. It has Huawei there. So, you know, there's also economic investment. So I don't know how, you know, how their foreign minister will really uh, uh, keep the fine line of trying to not antagonize Ukraine, which is economic partner, and at the same time, cottoning on to its strategic partner, um, uh, Russia. But I think um, it is beyond a proxy war. Here you are, the U.S. trying to declare that, oh, I am still a superpower. I will take care of the Atlantic Alliance, you know, NATO, et cetera, like that. And here is Ukraine, here is Putin, knowing what is the score on the ground and he's listening to Macron. Do you know, Carmina, how long he met with Macron? Five hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, you don't talk chismes in five hours. You're really talking, I mean, real talk and met with Scholz, the new chancellor of Germany, three hours. Okay, uh, pay attention to these small things because they matter. And so um, to your question, is it going to escalate to something which we all fear? I doubt very much. I doubt it is not in the interest of anybody to go to war, especially we're talking of nuclear powers. But when you have President Vladimir um, uh, Zelensky saying last night, before the announcement of Putin earlier today, that they will defend themselves, um, what's going to be the point of escalation there? What's going to happen next? I mean, all these forces, the, take the U.S., for example, who have vowed um, as well to protect the interests of, of, of Ukraine. I mean, should they just stand back and um, heed Putin's call to back off? Um, I think what will happen is, of course, they don't want to uh, to demonstrate that they're just being pushed by uh, their pushovers to what uh, Putin wants. As a matter of fact, um, uh, that's what they, they did when they tried to expand towards Ukraine. But, you know, NATO is not interested to give Article 5 to Ukraine. You know, Article 5, Carmina, is, you know, when Ukraine is uh, attacked, then it's an attack on everybody and like that. Yeah. And, uh, so many, many times they've declared they're not willing to do that. Hmm. But they're using that as a democracy uh, sword on top of uh, Putin's head. But, you know, uh, maybe a side story, Carmina, will give us a little bit more illumination in what's going on. When I was in Moscow, I can't remember, a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. I was meeting with my counterparts there. And do you know that they really are not talking about reviving the USSR? That's folly, you know. Uh, but what they want to do is to have a free trade area, an economic common market, an economic community of the former Soviet republics, which is really the way they're going. Mm -hmm. But um, by the way, little is known that once upon a time in the past, during the time of um, Bill Clinton, you know, Putin actually asked them if Russia can be a member of the NATO. Does anybody know that? Mm. Which means, why are they painting Putin as the enemy when they're neighbors, when they're, they form part of one big land mass? So, so how do you think? So how, so how do you think this will eventually resolve itself? If you highly doubt that it's going to escalate into a full-blown war, is this going to go the way Crimea went in 2014? Um, I think um, what most people want is to make Ukraine a buffer zone. And I don't think I like that term. You know, it's like, I mean, it's like you're sacrificing. I mean, the Ukrainians are human beings, for God's sake. Why are you mm -hmm. using them as a, you know, some blood tuning a wood for? I think Putin has to respect the sovereignty and the uh, independence of the Ukrainians. They want to side, uh, they want later on to be a member of the EU, let them, you know, yeah. they want later on to be uh, embraced by the NATO, let them. Mm. But what Putin does not want is the installation of missiles in Ukraine, which is similar, Carmina, to the installation of missiles in Cuba in the 60s. Mm. Do you see? So th that's why Putin was asking, does the U.S. want, you know, Mexico and Can the Canadian borders 
to be lined up with the soldiers of the enemy. And I think he has a right to, to ask that because it's similar, isn't it? Not the same, but similar. Professor Carlos, uh, on to the Asia-Pacific region. How do you think this will, the, the crisis in Ukraine will affect the region? Well, immediately you will see it in your pump you know, because uh, uh, Russia is one of the, you know, uh, it has huge oil reserves. And if the market moves, the market moves because the, one of the main players moves. So always when there is a danger of conflagration like this, it's really the commodities, you know, the movement of goods, even the movement of peoples, which will be highly affected. And I, even without Ukraine, Carmina, I'm sure, you know, I always watch this whenever I go to Tagaytay, you know, mm. we have a gasoline going as far as much as 78 pesos per liter, for Imagine. God's sake. Mm. It's, it's only a whisper towards 100, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, that's the major uh, backlash. Okay, earlier uh, on, the rest of the world. Yeah, earlier on, we were talking about you know the possibility, um, which is a concern for many, that this can be um, a proxy war between the U.S. and China, and with the various builds that China has in the West Philippine Sea, if it does amount to that. Do you think that it's highly possible that we also will be part of the next battleground if this escalates into a full-blown war? Yeah, that is what some observers are saying that, you know, don't allow Putin to do this because it will embolden China, that in, if it can be done in Ukraine, it can be done in the South China Sea. I don't think that will wash, you know, I don't buy that argument, Carmina. And China is uh, threatening to be the next superpower if it is not already a mm. superpower. Mm. China has to abide by international law. If it wants to change the rules of the game, we must be participant in the changes and the rules of the game. She cannot impose the new rules of the game because there are 200 of us, you know, and China, never mind that she has 25% of the total uh, population of the world, cannot just impose its will on the entire community. I think China realizes that. No? So, so finally, Professor, things really escalating within the last 24 hours. What do you think must happen? to sort of diffuse the tension, bring the temperature down, or is that even possible at this point? I think it is, you know, uh, we're not really at the cusp of war. So that means everybody back off, you know, Biden has to uh, reconfigure his position here, stop being the spokesperson of Putin and even declaring that, okay, on this date, the invasion will happen. And uh, Putin also has to back off, you know, um, Cooler heads will have to intervene, and the, uh, the cooler head would be Macron and Macron. Listen to Macron because he knows what is going on. All right, we're going to have to leave it at that. We've run out of time. Professor Clarita Carlos, UP Professor of Political Science. As I said earlier, nice to see you again, and thanks for joining us today. Take care, and okay. you keep safe. Nice to see you, Carmina. Bye-bye.